series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. Arizona's superstition mountains have been a magnet for generations of adventurers and treasure hunters. Many who come to the mountains seeking riches never return. In 1860, a miner called the Dutchman staggered out of the mountains more dead than alive. Something had kept him going when others would have given up. He had been tortured by Indians and seen his partner murdered. For days, he had traveled alone under the blazing sun. What was the secret that gave him the strength to survive? It was treasure, great nuggets of gold, the Dutchman said he'd found a mine full of it. He would never be strong enough to go back for more, however, and the secret of the mine's location went with him to the grave. Search for treasure in the Superstition Mountains begins at Weaver's Needle. The remnant of an ancient volcano, it has become a beacon for adventurers. Some treasure hunters believe the megalith marks the center of a magic circle that contains the untold wealth of a lost civilization. Long before magic powers were attributed to the area, Spain's conquistadors penetrated the mountains searching for the legendary kingdom of Cibola. They believed Cibola was composed of seven cities made from pure gold. The Spaniards even resorted to torture to pry information from the natives. The Apache has always related differently to the superstitions. They only say the mountains hide a sacred cave protected by a curse, guarded by rattlesnakes, charged with lightning bolts. Some say the Dutchman tore his treasure from the walls of the secret Apache cave. The Dutchman did claim that his partner was murdered. Perhaps it was an act of Apache vengeance. Gold has always inspired some men to acts of violence and great sacrifice. Ancients thought the metal had magic powers, that gold harnessed the energy of the sun. For centuries, alchemists tried to create gold in their crucibles. The secret always eluded them. Today we know that gold is one of nature's basic elements. It can't be broken down into any simpler substance, nor will it readily combine with another element. Thus, gold endures for all time to be sought after and measured out as the universal symbol of wealth. Since the Dutchman staggered out of the mountains with his sack of gold nuggets, no significant strike has been made in the superstitions. Yet the seekers keep coming, in spite of the lack of evidence, the harshness of the country, and the history of tragedy for those who've come before. It's an obsession, seemingly shared by most gold hunters. Some look for lost mines, like the Dutchman's. Others are after the legendary vein of pure gold, flowing like a river of yellow metal from the planet's molten core. This they call the mother load. Once, prospectors had only intuition and simple tools to pursue their quest. Now they have metal detectors and Geiger counters. Intuition still plays a big part. Pat Bowl is a retired science professor, recently turned prospector. His intuition paid off with an offer of $15,000 for an unusual sample of gold-bearing rock. I got 13.9 this spring when I, when I sold it, gave some to the government, and ended up with $9,000 $9, for 20 minutes' work with a pick. This will make a prospector out of anybody. Pat Bull may never find the vein of pure gold, but he has that fever now called the gold bug. It has driven other men to chip, blast, and burrow in the earth, searching for the ultimate source. 
The stampede that follows a strike is called a gold rush. In 1878, a rush hit Bodie, California like a flash flood. Known only as a place where miners could occasionally scrape out enough ore to live on, Bodie suddenly became a boom town, producing $200,000 a month in gold bullion. The town grew from a three-family prospector camp to a thriving community of 800 buildings and 10,000 people almost instantly. Two years after it began, the boom was over. A year later, the town was nearly empty. How often this phenomenon occurred across the gold fields isn't known for sure. No one remembers what happened to camps like Sucker Town, Gage Eye, Red Dog, and Hardtack. The gold didn't last long enough for them to have a past, much less a future. Today, many treasure hunters hear echoes of the gold rush and believe any one of a thousand tunnels that perforate the western mountains could tap the mother lode, or the lost Dutchman's mine. While preparing his book on the Dutchman legend, Robert Blair studied gold miners and dreamers. He concludes that without mineral evidence, miners wouldn't search the superstitions for gold. Dreamers, however, might. I suppose people go looking for the lost Dutchman for their own reasons. I can only speculate what those reasons are, but I think that a great many of these people who search in such a, an unpromising location for gold as the superstitions are going more for the adventure uh, than they are for any serious expectation of finding a rich gold mine. I think they're going for, for their own reasons as far as their own psychology is concerned, but perhaps it's an acting out of fantasy. It's one of the few places in the United States today which is unchanged. It's a wilderness area. There are no motor vehicles in there. It's almost like the old Wild West, when men went in with guns, fought it out among themselves, looking for a lost mine. Maybe the threat of Apaches is in the minds of some of these men. Maybe the man finds that when he's in the mountains that he becomes another person. He becomes more manly. The machismo effect may be working in the minds of those men who dig so endlessly in the superstitions and so fruitlessly. In 1931, an event took place which focused national attention on the superstitions. And this, apparently, is what has preserved the legend to this day. On a scorching summer day, a retired Washington bureaucrat, Adolph Ruth, rode into the superstitions. Carrying maps he believed would pinpoint the lost Dutchman mine, he struck out for Weaver's Needle. A 66-year-old greenhorn, Ruth had no idea of the danger he faced. He'd spoken freely about his maps, saying he was confident they were genuine. Ruth seemed oblivious to the temptation his maps represented. Six months from the day he set out with his cowboy guides, an archaeological party would find Ruth's skull. News of Ruth's mysterious death would not discourage others from trying. Hundreds would come to the superstitions looking for the now famous Dutchman mine. Like Ruth, many would find only tragedy. The superstitions have claimed hundreds of lives. Every year, the toll climbs. Some perish from too much sun and lack of water. Some die violently and mysteriously. Sightseers usually seek out an experienced guide for survival. Treasure hunters, however, only want help to reach a specific point. For many who go on alone, Packmaster and guide Jerry Crater is the last man they will ever see. 
I've been running a packing business in this country with my brother since 1968, 69. We pack prospectors, tourists, sightseers, but a large end of the business is packing prospectors that are searched for the lost Dutchman. We don't pack as many prospectors as we do treasure seekers. There's a big difference between treasure seekers and prospectors. Prospectors are looking for a vein, a clue in the mineral, and treasure seekers are operating from some map they picked up in a bar or something that their great uncle handed down to them, but they're looking for clues. Dutchman hunters come from all walks of life, all parts of the country. You have very wealthy men, you have the fellow that uh, hocked his mother's watch to rent a horse and get in here. And if they have a common denominator, it'd be the same one that a religious fanatic has. They believe. The chances of making a gold strike only based on mineral evidence are 10,000 to one. Some hedge their bet. They look for gold in the rock and in legend too. Jay Heston is a prospector and gold miner. He claims no bonanzas, but he has found gold. One day I thought I would look into the Lost Dutchman mine down in Arizona. But the more I looked, the more I realized I was looking for adventure or something to do more than I was looking for a mine. I don't think there's a mine there at all. I think maybe somebody may have left off some treasure at one time or another, but I think it's long since lost. With his lucky walking stick, he scours the west looking for more. A tedious and often dangerous venture. Since large gold deposits seldom lie on the surface, prospectors often use dynamite to blast out rock samples. More lost limbs and broken bodies can be attributed to accidents with dynamite than any other peril the prospector faces. Prospectors may shoot thousands of holes without hitting a rich vein of gold ore. with prospectors' holes, parts of the mountains look like the beachhead at Normandy on D-Day. If your intuition is right, if your luck is right, you sometimes pick up some gold. You're always looking for something better than what you've got. The astrologers say that gold is related to the sun. Maybe we're looking for that. Well, I'd never seen gold in the rock before I came here. And you take a rock off of a piece of property you've bought and you break it up and you swirl the water around in a pan and you see gold and uh, there's something fascinating about it. Weaver's needle is synonymous with the glint of gold for those who go in search of the lost Dutchman mine. The quest inevitably leads to the Apache Indians. Sometimes Superstition Mountain, uh, the way the Apache talks about it, sort of remind me of a place in Florida where the astronauts take off to go to outer space because there's a place to go where you take off to the other world. Philip Casador is a traditional Apache in a modern world. He has spent most of his life studying the ways of his people. He is also a medicine man with deep knowledge of ancient Apache ritual and mythology. To the Apache, I think the lost Dutchman's mind has two different story about it. One is uh, what the white men tell and one what the Apache tells. I think there's a Apache, when they talk about it, I think they talk about the, the Sickert Cave. And in that Sickert Cave is a lost, lost Dutchman's mine. The Mountain Spirit Dance celebrates the Earth's creation. 
Apaches say the mountain spirits protect the superstitions, and any violence or tragedy attributed to the Apaches is really the work of the spirits who live in the sacred cave. The Apache secret cave is a very secret cave. It's a very difficult thing to get inside of it, you know, because at one side, at the entrance, there's a female rattlesnake, and on one side, there's a male rattlesnake, and there's two cups, you know, that's made out of abalone shell, one for a female and one for a male. And to get inside of it, you have to have the blue stone and the white stone. The white stone, if you're a female, then you put it into the abalone shell, and then the the rattlesnake will come apart and then uh, you can go in there in that secret cave. Non-Indian people that go up there, they don't carry the blue stone and they don't know the prayer that the Apache pray before they go into that mountain. And the prayer is only made for the Apache and that mountain is set there for a purpose and that purpose is for Apache. And so uh, if they go in there without these kind of things, it can change your whole body and soul, your mind and everything, because you touch something that it should not be touched. How the Dutchman's mine and the sacred cave became entwined is a mystery to the Apache. They maintain, however, that looking for gold is no excuse for violating the cave. <laughs> Mysteries are Glenn McGill's business. He's a private detective in Oklahoma City. Patience and attention to detail are the virtues of his trade. McGill believes, with the right techniques, that any mystery can be solved, including the whereabouts of the lost Dutchman mine. The lost Dutchman mine is a different world altogether. It's out of character for us who are in the investigation business to get involved in this sort of thing. Far out, as you might say. In 1963, a group of Denver attorneys hired McGill to find the mine. With conviction and a spirit of adventure, he took the case. McGill thinks he found the mine in 1966, but not the vein of gold. In the fall of 1976, an amateur photographer documented McGill's 49th expedition into the superstitions. McGill admits spending thousands of dollars, as well as sacrificing family relations and business gains during his 14-year search for the gold. He is confident that he now knows where the gold is and believes the payoff will match the sacrifice. Planes come into focus at this very specific spot in the Superstition Mountains. The maps, the legend, the statements, the witnesses, our investigation, the evidence all comes together at one spot, and that's where we're digging. If our estimates are right, and we believe that they are, then the mine itself is composed of a vein of gold that is over 18 miles long. McGill also believes the mine carries a curse that may be influencing his life. It's uh, no doubt uh, taken some tolls upon me and my family and some of my very close friends. Uh, you might even say that it's uh, been responsible for shortening my life to some degree. Uh, I'm not in the best of health today as I was when I first started this investigation. Whether there is magic in Weaver's needle or not, it will undoubtedly remain the lodestone for new generations of seekers. The Dutchman said he found gold there. If it happened once, it could happen again. Dutchman hunters have never been popular among the Apaches who still regard the Superstition Mountains as sacred. The environmentalists don't like gold seekers either. They want to preserve the mountain as a wilderness area. The Apaches and the environmentalists have won their case in Congress. In 1984, the Superstition Mountains will be off limits to treasure hunters and prospectors. Passing a law is one thing, banishing a dream is another. The dream is constantly being revived by stories like the one told by prospector Milt Rose. Uh, I talked to three men who were with the Dutchman when he died and helped to 
uh, draw the map that he drew. They drew me a map of this thing and put all the names and things on it that was should be there. And then I went to look for it from there and found it. And there was a goal there, and I got about $18,000 out of a pocket, which it proved to be, and it didn't last very long. The Lost Dutchman mine has no relation to the superstitions or to the weaver's needle. It is in the Four Peaks country at about 4,800 feet in a big canyon. My personal feeling about the Lost Dutchman mine is that there's more gold in my back teeth than there is in this whole range of mountains. And I just don't believe it's here. I've packed them in for 10 years and have yet to pack a ore sample out. Even if you ground up the Superstition Mountains and ran them through a sieve and found not one ounce of gold, there are those who would say you should have dug a foot down deeper and you would have found the real gold. People dream. They hear these stories and they're greedy. They think that God meant them to find this gold and reserved it for them and they're going to go and find it. So they go in there by the thousands. There was over 10,000 people from 1878 to 1891 in the superstitions before the Dutchman died and left his legend. Tonight on the History Channel, some called it a wartime experiment in civility. Hitler's men had expected to be tortured or forced into hard labor. What actually happened to them was quite surprising. Nazi POWs in America on History Undercover with Arthur Kent. Tonight at 8 on the History Channel.